Welcome to the 2024 concessionaire orientation video. You should have just watched On the Water, Glacier Bay's general boater orientation video. This segment will provide a review of highlights of requirements under your concessions contract with us. Your commercial services team here at Glacier Bay is a team of five people currently. Melanie Berg is our chief of commercial services. Elizabeth Gersio, Rebecca Mitria, Whitney Rapp, and Zachary Benedict are your concessions management specialists. While at the public use dock of Bartlett Cove, please be aware of the rules while boating around. As a reminder, you do not need to use one of your entry permits if you are only motoring east of the fuel pier. You may also launch a skiff off of your main vessel without an additional permit, only if you are east of the fuel pier. For 2024, the Glacier Bay Lodge will operate from Memorial Day through Labor Day. For exact dates, please reference the Lodge website and the Concessioner Resources webpage. The Visitor Information Station is open 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. in May, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in June, July, and August, and 8 o'clock to 5 p.m. in September. You can contact the Visitor Information Station by hailing them on the radio at KWM20 Bartlett Cove or by phone at 907-697-2627. Glacier Bay is ever-changing as landslides and glacial rebound make their mark on the landscape. Please be aware of currents, tides, and weather while in the park, including the above information. Feeding and hunting wildlife is prohibited in the park. Launching and using drones, discharging firearms and explosives are prohibited. Your AIS must be broadcasting at all times while you're operating in the park. While in the bay, your vessel is under a limited entry permit. A skiff launch from the anchored vessel continues to carry that permit. There must be only one vessel operating under that entry permit, whether it be the skiff or the main vessel. Tenders, skiffs, and dibs must have their own entry permit if they want to operate at the same time as the larger vessel in the bay. If you are outside of the bay, the limited entry permit does not apply and you may have multiple skiffs in the water launched from the main vessel. If you are on the land, whether inside or outside of the bay, it is more than likely that you are in designated wilderness. The wilderness boundary is mean high tide. The group size limit is 12, and that includes guides, and you must be out of sight and sound of each other. If you are not in wilderness, which is most of the park's marine waters, the group size is 12, and groups must disperse, preferably out and outside of sight and sound of other groups. Here are some charter vessel specific regulations. The use of Dundas Bay is limited to those charter vessel contract holders who have an allocation for the bay. During the June through August permit season, charter vessels are restricted from utilizing a private boating permit and from using a commercial charter entry for a private trip without prior written approval from the superintendent. Those approvals will be made by a case-by-case -case basis. Franchise fees are for any location within the park boundary, including the portion of Excursion Inlet, Outer Waters, Glacier Bay, and other bays within the park boundary. When paying fees, be sure to use Glacier Bay National Park's form and not Glacier National Park. Scheduling. Scheduling applies to Glacier Bay itself from June 1 to September 30th. Our GIS department has created a suite of guides, maps, and charts to help you navigate the park's complex regulations and your contract requirements. These maps are available on the Concessionaire Resources webpage, and many are also available on the Avenza app. You can find the chart showing select Glacier Bay regulations throughout the year, the South Marble Island map showing appropriate approach distances, the Johns Hopkins Inlet map indicating approach guidelines for glacial areas, and the Tour Vessel Quick Guide to Areas with Restrictions and Closures, which is a quick 
uh, guide to draw your attention to restrictions and closures, but is not intended to give you uh, the detailed information. So please use those more detailed area charts as you navigate near these areas. Now we are going to focus on tour vessel requirements for operating in Glacier Bay, specifically focusing on those off vessel activities. Before we get too far into the weeds, please note that the following apply to all tour vessels at all times when operating in the park and getting visitors into the resource. Tour vessels are authorized to provide off vessel activities that are non motorized water and land based activities that are day use only. Tour vessels are prohibited from operating in wilderness waters or areas closed to motorized vessel traffic. And tour vessels may not offer guided fishing services or provide fishing equipment to guests. With these basic ground rules, let's look at the different areas that off vessel activities can occur and under what parameters. The first area you might take visitors off vessel is in the front country in the Bartlett Cove developed area. In the space illustrated above, there is no group size limit and guests may explore on their own or you may offer guided activities. There is so much to explore. Please just remember, as this is not wilderness, we ask visitors to remain on established paths of travel. So moving on from the front country, a large portion of the water in Glacier Bay is non-wilderness as well. When operating in these waters, please note that off vessel activities may occur when only one tour vessel is in an area and group sizes, including guides, may not exceed 12 persons. Groups that launch must be out of sight of one another or one nautical mile apart. The goal is to provide guests that small ex experience and to minimize intrusion on that experience. Note there is no limit on how many groups can be in non-wilderness waters, just that they are out of sight of one another. This is in comparison to wilderness off-vessel activities. We are going to focus specifically on land-based activities for this slide, as a vast majority of land in the park is designated as wilderness, with a big W. When you are taking groups onto land in designated wilderness, the aim is still the same as before to minimize intrusion on other groups and other visitors. To achieve that, remember, one tour vessel in an area at a time, max of 12 persons in a group, and this is where the slight difference comes in, so pay attention. There can be no more than two groups from one tour vessel in wilderness, and groups must strictly adhere to out-of-sight provisions. This goes for the groups on the tour vessel and other visitors. So what that means practically, if you are scouting for a wilderness-based land activity, such as a hike or a bushwhack, take stock of other wilderness users. If you see kayaks or tents on a beach indicating use by another user group, those out of sight rules apply to them as well. Don't go hiking near them, stay out of sight of them. Help them to preserve their wilderness experience. With that being said, there are a few identified focused use areas that the service has identified that reside within glacier access zones. The idea of these zones is to provide space for individuals to explore and experience how Glacier Bay was formed. In these zones, as identified on the maps above, more than two wilderness based activities may occur. Group size limit is still 12 but activities may take place when other visitors are present. However, groups must disperse in different directions. So might you see or possibly run into a, another group? Maybe, but the idea is not to hang out with them. Make it as much of a wilderness experience as possible while acknowledging that you might see other humans in these zones. Now, whether you're in a focused use area or the front country, or anywhere in between. It is important that we be good stewards of this place. One of the main ways to accomplish this is to leave no trace. Help your guests plan and prepare for their off vessel activity. Choose to walk on hardened or rocky durable surfaces to protect fragile vegetation. 
Leave what you find and dispose of all waste in the appropriate manner. Respect the wildlife that call this place home and pay special attention to the wildlife approach regulations that will be highlighted later in this presentation. And finally, be considerate and respectful of others around you. So after an immersive off vessel ex experience, regardless of location, please operators and guides, don't forget to fill out the required operational and off vessel activity report and turn it into your respective company representative monthly. Both forms are in one Excel document for your ease of use and can be found at the concessioner resource webpage that will be highlighted again momentarily. These reports are so valuable for our scientists, who you hear from in a moment. They study and use this data you provide for their scientific research and to assist in making park management decisions. And now for a few more requirements on reporting from a more operational standpoint. Reporting, you must provide the superintendent immediate written notice of any discharge, release, or threatened release within or at the vicinity of the park. This includes solids, semi-solids, liquids, or gases, any hazardous or toxic substance, any contaminant, pollutant, petroleum, petroleum product, or byproduct. You must provide us notice of any threatened or actual notice of violation from all other regulatory agencies, and you must immediately report any violations of National Park Service regulations to the Commercial Services Office. These include any personal injury to clients or crew that require more than first aid, wildlife incidents, property damage over $500, any whale strikes or possible whale strikes. In case of an emergency, you can reach the NPS Alaska Regional Communication Center or ARCC. They operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week and can be reached by phone at 907-697 2651 or by hailing National Park Service Emergency Dispatch via Marine VHF Channel 16 or of course by calling Mayday 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 on Marine VHF 16. Be sure to contact the Commercial Services Office at 907-697-2567 or GLABA underscore concessions at mps.gov to give notice of any incident. Specific medevac procedures. Have the captain call ARCC. Please include the following information. The nature of the situation, the location, the level of care that is currently being provided, and contact information. Depending upon the medical situation, the level of medical training of those on board, the supplies available, and the environmental situation, ARCC can notify the park rangers. These conditions will determine the park's response. Periodic evaluations are an important component of your contract and weigh into your annual overall rating. The components of the periodic operational evaluation and annual overall rating can be found in the evaluation portion of your contract's operating plan. Remember, your contract requires you to provide full access to management, property, documentation, and other resources necessary for the service to conduct these evaluations. Plus, having a completed periodic evaluation assists you on your annual overall rating. If you find your operation in need of educational materials, we have park maps and fair weather newspapers available at the Visitor Information Station. Don't forget the NPS app. We're always adding more material to the app so you can download it for offline use. If you're interested in experiencing the Huna Tribal House or the Visitor Center located in the Lodge, the hours of operation and seasonal programs will be available on the park website, as well as posted in the visitor center and at the lodge. The cultural resources in Glacier Bay are protected by multiple laws and regulations. The forefront of these are the National Historic Protection Act and the Archaeological Resource Protection Act. The National Historic Protection Act mandates federal agencies to identify cultural resources within federal lands. The Archaeological Resource Protection Act, or ARPA, recognizes that the archaeological resources are an irreplaceable part of America's heritage and that they were increasingly in danger. Violating ARPA carries stiff penalties and jail time. When you're adventuring in the park or preserve, it is important to pay attention to your surroundings 
and avoid impacting any historic structures or cultural resources. As a reminder, please do not disturb or remove objects from these places, buildings, or sites. Enjoyment of the national parks is a fundamental part of the visitor experience. That experience is heightened when a connection is made by linking the park's resources to values, meanings, and environments. So please enjoy the rare occurrence of stumbling onto a cultural resource and allow them the protections they need and deserve. We're excited for you to visit the historic Glacier Bay Lodge and the Tribal House this summer. For more resources such as up-to-date schedules, activity report forms, maps, and more, check out the Concessionaire Resources webpage. After you've watched On the Water and this 2024 Concessionaire Orientation video, please fill out and send us your verification form. You can send it in by email or mail. Do not drop them off at the Visitor Information Station. If you have any questions, please contact us at GLBA underscore concessions at mps.gov. We look forward to seeing you soon and have a great 2024 season. Hi, my name is Janet Nielsen and I'm a whale biologist at Glacier Bay National Park. We are all so lucky to work in one of the most beautiful places on earth and to spend time around some of the coolest wildlife in the world, marine mammals. I want you to care about these animals as much as I do, so I'm excited to share this presentation with you. Today, I'm going to share a few brief research updates, but my main goal is to provide you with tips on how to abide by park regulations to keep both people and marine mammals safe. Here's a visual of the most commonly cited marine mammals in Glacier Bay. I'll start with some hot off the press news about killer whales. Did you know that there are many different kinds or ecotypes of killer whales in the world? At least 10 different ecotypes have been described worldwide, and three of these ecotypes are present in the North Pacific. When you see killer whales in Glacier Bay, they are most likely either the ecotype known as transient or Biggs killer whales, or the ecotype known as resident killer whales. From a distance, these two ecotypes look very similar, but look more closely at their physical features, diets, genetics, acoustics, and group structure, and these are very, very different animals. Recently, scientists proposed that these two ecotypes should be recognized as two completely separate species. You can scan the QR code to read more. My work at the park focuses on monitoring the population of humpback whales in Glacier Bay and Icy Strait. The park's whale monitoring program, which started in 1985, is now one of the longest running studies of humpback whales in the world, this will be our 40th year of monitoring. This photo shows our research vessel, a 19-foot safe boat called the Sand Lance. This year, our team is comprised of program lead Chris Gabriel, myself, and Holly Hofbauer. Every year, we summarize what we find in an annual report. A 10-page report summarizing what we found last summer is available on the park's website. We try to make these reports easy to read and packed with information with key findings summarized on the first page. You can scan this QR code to link to the 2023 report. Reports from past years are also available on the park's website. I also want to mention a few other important new whale updates. Last October, we worked to disentangle a humpback whale from crab pot gear just outside the park in Icy Strait. You can read a full account of this amazing story by scanning the QR code. In February, we published a paper with many of our colleagues that includes an updated population estimate for humpback whales in the North Pacific. The key takeaway from this study is that the humpback whale population was growing until a marine heat wave many know as the blob caused an, um, caused an abrupt crash in recent years. This crash especially impacted the Hawaii population, which is where most of the humpback whales in Southeast Alaska migrate to in the winter. This story got a lot of press, including this local piece by KTOO News. These recent findings support a paper that we published back in 2022, describing abrupt declines in humpback whale survival and reproduction during the blob. Scan all these QR codes if you'd like to learn more. 
In this changing world, the park's regulations to protect marine mammals are more important than ever. For humpback whales, the park has a number of regulations to help protect these whales from collisions and disturbance. The first level of protection is our humpback whale approach regulations. Put simply, all vessels, including kayaks, are prohibited from approaching within one quarter nautical mile of a humpback whale in all park waters. It is important to note that this rule applies not only in Glacier Bay, but also in park waters in Icy Strait and Cross Sound. In addition, any vessel that is within one half nautical mile of a humpback whale may not alter course or speed to approach or get closer to the whale. If you find yourself within one quarter nautical mile of a humpback whale, what should you do? First, slow your vessel down to 10 knots or less. Do not shift into reverse unless impact is likely. Next, direct the vessel on a steady course away from the whale until at least one quarter nautical mile away. These regulations can be confusing, so the following four slides outline four specific scenarios and summarize what you should and shouldn't do in each scenario. I encourage you to pause the video on each one of these four slides to study and understand each scenario. Scenario one. Scenario two. Scenario three. Scenario four. For those of you who do off-vessel kayak operations, it's important to remember that the park's humpback whale approach regulations also apply to kayaks. Kayakers in park waters may not approach a humpback whale within one quarter nautical mile. It's also important to remember that any time a vessel is quiet, whether it is at anchor, drifting with the motor off, or a kayak, humpback whales cannot detect your presence. Humpback whales do not have echolocation, so if you are drifting silently or paddling quietly, do not ever assume that a humpback whale knows where you are. Whales are very busy. They are focused on feeding and socializing. They are not necessarily paying attention to their surroundings. There may also be underwater sound from motorized vessels nearby that prevents the whale from hearing the quiet nearby vessel or kayak. The one quarter mile approach regulation helps keep you and your guests safe. If you're in a kayak and you discover that a whale is close by, you can make noise to help the whale know that you are there. Knock on your hull with your paddle. In smaller boats that are drifting or anchored, you can stomp on the hull. Outside park waters, the regulations are different. Outside park waters, there is a 100 yard approach regulation for humpback whales in Alaska. In addition, the regulations state that you may not place your vessel in the path of an oncoming humpback whale in order to cause it to surface within 100 yards. And you must operate your vessel at a slow, safe speed when near a humpback whale. NOAA also recommends limiting your viewing time to 30 minutes. The second level of protection that we have for humpback whales in park waters is whale waters. Whale waters are areas in the park with vessel course and speed restrictions designated by the park superintendent due to the consistent presence of humpback whales in the area. In other words, whale waters are places where humpback whales are concentrating to feed. Lower Glacier Bay is historically an important feeding habitat for humpback whales, therefore it is protected annually as whale waters. From May 15th to September 30th, there is a 20 knot speed limit in Lower Bay whale waters. This speed limit is lowered to 13 knots when whale activity increases in the lower bay. In addition, all vessels over 18 feet in length are required to travel mid-channel or at least one mile offshore through lower bay whale waters. This is because although humpback whales can be seen anywhere, they are more likely to be present feeding close to shore. By keeping motorized boats and whales separate, we can reduce the chances of collisions and disturbance. There are no speed limits outside whale waters areas. However, it is important to remember that whales can show up anywhere unexpectedly. Please slow down if you are in an area with whales, even if whale waters are not in place. Remember to always operate your vessel at a slow, safe speed when near humpback whales. In addition, temporary whale waters can be designated anywhere in the park based on consistent whale presence. Last year, we had several temporary whale waters areas delineated in the mid-bay and west arm. Watch for press releases 
and listen for Whale Waters updates after the daily weather broadcast from the Viz. When whales are in mid-channel, it is important to alter your course to avoid them. Even though the park's whale waters regulation say to stay in mid-channel, the intent behind the regulation is to separate vessels from whales. If the whale is mid-channel, then alter course as needed to avoid it, then resume a mid-channel course. If it comes down to a choice of staying mid-channel or avoiding a whale, avoid the whale. For other whale species, the park does not have a set approach regulation but we do recommend not to approach closer than, 100, closer than 100 yards. However, if you change an animal's behavior, you are too close and you should give the whale more space. So how can you help us to protect humpback whales in the park besides abiding by the regulations and giving whales the space they need? We are especially interested in humpback whale mother calf pair sightings and any unusual sightings. Please report your settings to the Viz or directly to our research vessel, the Sandlance. We monitor channels 12 and 16. You can also contribute any humpback whale fluke photos that you or your guests acquire to happywhale.com, an online platform that will automatically match the whale's tail and tell you more about it. These photos also help researchers like us who study these animals. Another way you can help is to log your whale sightings in a free app called Whale Alert. Since 2016, Whale Alert Alaska has been a collaboration between the park, NOAA, and the cruise lines. Whale Alert creates a sighting map for cruise ship bridge, team, for cruise ship bridge crews to help them avoid collisions. When there have been lots of sightings in an area, cruise ships can take extra actions to help prevent collisions, like post an extra lookout or choose to preemptively reduce their speed. The map is intended for cruise ship use only, but you and your passengers can help to increase situational awareness for cruise ships and reduce the likelihood of collisions by getting the app and recording sightings that contribute to the map. Now we'll review the park's regulations to protect seals and sea lions. First, harbor seals. Johns Hopkins Inlet is an important habitat for harbor seal pupping. Therefore, the inlet is closed to all vessels, including kayaks, from May 1st to June 30th. Beginning July 1st, Johns Hopkins Inlet opens to all vessels except cruise ships. Beginning September 1st, cruise ships may enter the inlet. Vessels entering July 1st through August 31st must stay one quarter mile away from seals hauled out on ice, and there is a 10 knot vessel speed limit. It's important to note that icebergs and seals may be present outside the Johns Hopkins seasonal closure area and near other glacial faces. Always approach and depart fjords with a plan to avoid surprising seals. Avoid travel through thick ice. Always try to stay one quarter mile from seals hauled out on ice. Minimize your vessel's wake and avoid loud noises. Remember, you are too close if you observe a change in an animal's behavior. To help protect stellar sea lions from disturbance, vessels must stay at least 100 yards away from any hauled out stellar sea lion anywhere in the park. Again, you are too close if you observe a change in an animal's behavior. South Marble Island is a spectacular place to see stellar sea lions and a wonderful place for bird watching. How can we enjoy and protect this important habitat? It used to be that stellar sea lions only hauled out on the north end of the island, but now they haul out on most accessible areas of the island with very high numbers on the southern end. It is a park regulation to stay at least 100 yards from any hauled out stellar sea lion and to avoid changing an animal's behavior. By regulation, vessels must always stay at least 100 yards away from the north half of South Marble Island, indicated here as the red line. Along the southern half of the island, vessels may approach to 50 yards to watch birds, which is shown in green. However, vessels must stay 100 yards away from any hauled out sea lion. And because sea lions are regularly hauling out on the southern half of the island now, the reality is that most of the time you will need to stay at least 100 yards away from all areas on South Marble Island. If stellar sea lions are not hauled out in an area of the southern half where you want to view birds, you may approach to 50 yards. As you can see from this AIS plot of tour and charter vessels in 2019, 
many vessels are getting too close to South Marble Island, especially on the north end of the island where vessels must always stay 100 yards offshore. To help vessels abide by the South Marble Island approach regulations and prevent disturbance to stellar sea lions, waypoints are available to delineate 100 yards. Contact Glacier Bay Commercial Services to obtain these waypoints. Another way that you can help marine mammals is to report any strandings that you see. In the park, the best way to pass on a stranding report is by calling the VIZ as soon as possible. You can also call the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Hotline, which is a statewide hotline available 24-7. Lastly, I'd like to mention the Bartlett Cove Hydrophone. There is an underwater microphone anchored outside Bartlett Cove that has been in place for many years to help the park understand and study underwater sounds, including the sounds of Glacier Bay's marine mammals. The location of the hydrophone is shown here with a green circle and star. A cable runs approximately five miles from the hydrophone back to our office in park headquarters. Please be aware of the location of this cable and avoid anchoring or bottom fishing near the hydrophone and cable. If you accidentally snag the cable, please report it right away to the sand lance or viz with the exact location. Sometimes the cable is damaged by these events and it is incredibly helpful if we can pinpoint where the cable needs to be repaired. Otherwise, when it stops working, we have to check all five miles of cable to determine where the problem occurred. Well, that's all I have today. If you have any questions, my contact information is shown here. I hope that everyone has a great 2024 season. Please say hello to us on the dock and keep in touch. Hi folks, welcome to Snowy Spring Glacier Bay. I'm Tanya Lewis, the terrestrial wildlife biologist at the park, and I'm here to give you some updates on research we've been doing as well as some reminders and welcome you to the 2024 season. All right, some of the projects I'm going to talk about are our wolf diet and distribution study, uh, bear safety, uh, and ways to minimize wildlife disturbance over the course of the summer, uh, nesting seabirds, and a new soundscape project that we have. Uh, some of the projects uh, research that we have ongoing that I'm not going to talk about, but you can find more on my website or the park website, includes research on brown bears, Glacier bears, um, which are a very rare color phase of black bear, uh, moose, mountain goats, and post-glacial mammal, mammal succession, as well as visitors and wildlife disturbance. First, we'll start with a research update on wolf diet. Um, we have been collecting scat samples from wolves across the shoreline of Glacier Bay for a few years now. And this is part of a bigger study looking at uh, wolf diet from all the way from Lake Clark National Park up in Cook Inlet all the way down to Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska and farther south. So it's been a really, really fun collaboration and lots of interesting results coming out. And um, the picture of that scat with my finger uh, we found last summer, and that is a full hoary marmot foot in that scat. So it's been pretty fun to see what we can learn from these non-invasive scat samples. Here's some preliminary diets. Uh, if we look at all of those samples that we've collected along the shoreline of Glacier Bay together, number one food is ungulate, which includes moose and deer. And number two is sea otter. And this is a trend we're seeing from Katmai down to um, Gustavus and Pleasant Island all through Glacier Bay is that sea otter is a main component of wolf diet, which is a relatively new feature based on the fact that sea otters have been increasing in all these areas. So next on the list is small rodent, then anadromous fish, which is salmon, and uh, passerines, which are songbirds. And then other fish, which are mostly, we think, intertidal fish, such as blennies and gunnels that live under the rocks that um, wolves are foraging for. And then uh, seabirds is next, and then a variety of other, um, other prey items. This picture uh, we caught from a motion sensor camera last summer, and that's a wolf holding a uh, harbor porpoise tail. So that was pretty interesting. 
So in addition to collecting scats, we also put out some motion sensor cameras. Uh, and the goal there is to get pack composition and distribution and then size uh, number of pups in particular. So I'll show this video and um, show you how we can count pups with these cameras. Um, the animals that are a little bit smaller are the pups of the year. This video is taken in October. See how many you can count. So uh, this research is ongoing. We're gonna continue to collect scat throughout the shoreline and the park looking at diet. Um, we are documenting shoreline wolf hotspots. And um, I'll talk more about wildlife disturbance, but one really important thing for you to know is that wolves are very vulnerable to disturbance when they're denning in the early part of the summer through June and even into July. So if you see areas with a lot of wolf sign or if you hear howling that sounds um, kind of barking, they, they do sort of an alarm bark howl when they're disturbed please move out of the area and don't take uh, groups of people to these areas uh, because they will move their den if they feel like they've been disturbed and um, it just creates a lot of undue stress. Um, so something to watch out for and listen for. Um, because wolves are eating sea otters and to such a high degree, uh, sea otters are a top marine predator that bioaccumulate toxins and so wolves there's some evidence that wolves are have a higher chance of um, high levels of heavy metals mercury in particular as well as possibly toxic algae and PFAS chemicals so we are collecting samples um, as well from from wolves and everything in their food web um, if you do see any carcasses anywhere please let us know carcasses hair are great um, great ways to collect these samples. Um, and then we are also collecting hair for genetic ID and population structure of gray wolves throughout Southeast Alaska. Moving on to bears, um, some ways to minimize bear human conflicts. Please stay 100 yards from bears on the beach and from the vessel, which I'll talk more about in a sec. Educate yourselves and your passengers. A lot of people are very worried about bears when they go to the shoreline in Alaska. So more information they have, uh, understanding a bear behavior and how to respond to an encounter is very helpful. And the most important thing is that bears do not get food or gear from people. And um, gear can be a reward as well. If a bear has fun playing with say a life jacket, and chewing on it and rolling in it, then that can be viewed as a reward. So we wanna keep all food and gear, um, make sure it's attended at all times so bears can't get it. And please report any concerning encounter you have with bears as well as any sick bears or wildlife, or as I mentioned, carcasses, all that's very important for us to know so we can take uh, management actions if needed and warn others of potential risks in a certain area. So vessel-based bear viewing, um, really important. Most bear viewing in Glacier Bay is from a vessel. And so a few years ago, we did a study looking at how close is too close uh, to bears on the beach. Um, this kayaker is definitely too close. Uh, and I thought I'd share that with you now um, so that you have that information going into the season. Uh, we did experimental approaches from a boat to bears on the beach and we recorded their behavior as we approached. And we did 24 approaches and calculated the time they spent in each behavior at the different distances. Uh, the red dots are where we did these approaches. Of course, it was mostly the West Arm because that's where you find bears on the beach most commonly. Behavior categories included stress behaviors, um, vigilance, posturing, fleeing, huffing, um, this top photo is a vigilant bear looking directly at us on the vessel. That is a stress behavior. Um, that bear is no longer doing natural food or natural um, behaviors such as eating or walking. It is, um, it is reacting to the vessel. Versus energetic gain, 
behaviors such as foraging or resting, like the bear on the bottom picture, is just continuing to eat its muscles. It is not disturbed. So we found that bears reacted to vessels in 75% of the trials at distances from 30 to 740 meters. So huge variability between individual bears, and I'm sure some of you have seen that. Um, some are very tolerant and some are not. Uh, bears were displaced in only nine of the 24 trials, so uh, far fewer were displaced than disturbed. Uh, again, at a wide variety of distances from 19 to 740 meters. So um, when we look at those feeding, um, energetic gain versus stress behaviors, we can see feeding behavior did not change across distance. Distance is um, the x-axis on the bottom. Um, as we move to the right, we're getting closer, the boat's getting closer and closer. Bears continued to feed, but if you look at the red line, the stress behaviors increased and significantly increased within 100 meters. Uh, when the boat was within 100 meters, the bear was exhibiting significantly more stress behavior. So uh, for that reason, we recommend please stay at least 100 yards, 100 meters, 100 yards. We, we use yards because it's easier for people to um, imagine the distance, I think. Um, please stay 100 yards from bears on the beach. And if the bear is looking at you, it is aware of you, it is reacting to you, you're too close. Um, remain quiet. If you can keep people quiet and avoid sudden boat movements or noises from the boat, that will help. If possible, try to remain downwind. Many times bears react to smell a lot stronger than they do to sight. Uh, so they may not react until they catch your scent. And again, if they change behavior, including even just looking at you, please increase your distance. Lots of people want to see these bears on the beach. We want bears to have access to the beach. Very, very important place for them to feed. And um, that's true for wolves and other wildlife as well. So. Please watch the animal and um, and try not to disturb it. As a reminder, um, salmon streams are a very important food resource for bears as well as wolves and other critters. And so for that reason, for tour vessels, um, when salmon are actively spawning, um, no shore hikes within a quarter mile of the river above high tide to allow for those animals to access that important food resource. The exception, of course, is the Bartlett River in Bartlett Cove. So some general ways to minimize wildlife displacement. Um, a, a management strategy that we have at the park is to try to concentrate high numbers of visitors at shoreline locations with lower habitat quality and Luckily, glaciers fit in that category. Um, you know, glaciers tend to be pretty rocky, barren, and not a ton of habitat for many species. And so we have these focal use areas for tour vessels in these places so people can have an opportunity to enjoy the, the glaciers and there's minimal wildlife disturbance. Now, some other places with high habitat quality um, and some examples I'll just throw out are, um, you know, the Sandy Spokane Coves area, Bear Track Cove, Gloomy Knob, um, Fern Harbor. These areas are very important for multiple species of wildlife, and these are places that we would like to disperse visitors and, and make sure there's just low numbers of visitors going to those areas, okay? We'll watch these areas if we feel like visitation is getting too high, um, we may do something or let you know, um, but we're just asking you to be aware of these places as well and try not to take too many people to these um, high quality habitat areas. Uh, so one thing you can do in these areas though is utilize water-based, vessel-based wildlife viewing. And it's kind of a win-win for everyone because if you can watch wildlife without disturbing it, um, people can just get to get to observe and take pictures of these animals for longer. And it's a win for the animals because they don't get displaced from very important shoreline habitat areas. So we definitely encourage this vessel based wildlife viewing um, in ways that minimize disturbance to the animals on the beach. And again, please stay far enough from from these animals that you do not change their behavior. And um, we all win that way. 
Nesting seabirds, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, we have many, many islands closed to protect nesting seabirds, but there are also uh, nesting seabirds in areas that aren't closed. So if you do come upon uh, a colony of nesting seabirds like glockswing gulls, mew gulls, arctic terns, please stay at least 100 yards. And um, solitary nesters such as black oyster catchers, please stay 50 yards from the nest at least. And the cool thing is these birds will tell you when you're too close and if they start dive bombing you or yelling at you, uh, please increase your distance, gather up your people and go the other way. OK, lastly, I'm just going to tell you about this exciting new project. We have been doing um, soundscape monitoring above and below water for for several years now, but this year and next year we're combining efforts and um, we're going to be creating a sound propagation model. So how vessel noise propagates below water and above water. Uh, we're working with um, Cornell University on this and um, it's a collaboration between myself and Chris Gabriel, our humpback whale biologist, and we're very excited about it. And so you may have uh, received our flyer asking for help. Our hope is to get a sound signature uh, from every vessel that commonly um, comes into Glacier Bay. And basically uh, it's it's a matter of driving by our array of above and underwater microphones at a certain distance and certain speeds. And what this gives us is um, data to input into our, to develop our model that um, can look at how sound propagates at different speeds, different vessels um, across Glacier Bay. So please reach out if you haven't already about participating in this. It will be pretty low effort on your part, but very, very important in making sure our model is based on real data. That's all I have. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great summer. And again, there's my contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out if uh, you have any questions or see anything cool. Um, for immediate reports, please um, notify the visitor information station um, and they will get the important um, information to me as quickly as we can. So, all right, thank you so much. Have a great summer. And welcome. My name is Chad Soyseth. I'm a fisheries biologist at Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, my counterpart is Craig Murdoch. It's possible that if you contact, try to contact myself or him, um, you'll get one, one or the other of us. Today I'm going to talk to you about guided charter fishing in Glacier Bay National Park. I'm going to talk about how fishing in the park is different relative to areas outside the park. I want to recognize the guide's role, your guys' role, in influencing client expectation and experience. And then finally, I'm just going to go over some of the cons concessions contract requirements and the reasoning behind those. Fishing in the park is different for other reasons as well. Uh, our enabling legislation, um, establishing the park, uh, came about because a scientist, ecologist William S. Cooper, who was early in the park, looking at how vegetation communities changed over time and at distances from glaciers, gave a talk to the Ecological Society of America. And they had a discussion after he talked about the importance of Glacier Bay as an area to do science. And, and the ESA, along with other scientists, were key in petitioning President Coolidge for protection of Glacier Bay. And essentially, Glacier Bay was established for the study of glaciation, animal movement, and ecosystem succession, among other things. Um, the National Park Service Management Policies, it's a 2006 document that kind of rolls up the Organic Act, uh, the Enabling Proclamation, and other regulation and guidance, requires us to monitor harvest. There's supposed to be no unacceptable impact to park resources or natural processes distributions, densities, or age class distributions, and no unacceptable impact to native species important to harvested species, or likewise native species using harvested species for any purpose. There's a long history of recreational fishing in Glacier Bay. Uh, these two middle, middle panels I want to draw your eye to uh, just uh, represent some of the earliest documentation of recreational fishing in, in southeast Alaska. There's uh, 
a variety of clients aboard the steamship Spokane that if you look closely, you can see that they've been handlining halibut. There's a variety of halibut on the deck. So the Spokane came to, to Glacier Bay periodically in the early 1900s and, and visited uh, Muir Glacier. Uh, construction began in, on uh, Glacier Bay Lodge in 1965 when it was completed. Shortly thereafter, uh, Frank Kearns was the first concessions manager there. Here's Frank with a, a relatively large salmon. And uh, this last panel on the right here, last image on the right, um, is, uh, is an image that is, uh, illustrates much the same activity as we see today in uh, respective uh, areas adjacent to the park. In terms of Glacier Bay halibut harvest, I just wanted to draw your eye to this graph. Um, you can see that uh, commercial harvest historically accounted for the lion's share of harvest. However, this has, has declined quite a bit, especially over the last decade. And one of the most important things that I wanted to emphasize is just that recreational and commercial harvest levels are, are, have been pretty comparable since 2011. And that's likely to continue on into the future. Collectively, we all need to collaborate to become better resource stewards. How can we work together to best ensure that the halibut resource and the industry um, continues on into the future? As guides, you guys have lots of power and authority. There was a, a study by Jason Gasper and others by the, associated with the University of Washington, I think back in 2004, where they uh, surveyed a variety of Gustavus clients and guides and questioned them in particular about um, fishing technique and, and guidance relating to large halibut release and, and the rationale behind that release. 140 clients and 13 guides participated in the survey and 70% of the clients said that the guides encouraged them to release fish and 90% of them cited a biological rationale. Larger females produce greater numbers of eggs, so you should release those fish. And half of clients actually releasing large fish said that they, one of the reasons they released those fish was because they were encouraged by the guide. Um, the client openness to the guide messaging really influenced the, their willingness to release large fish. So just in, in looking at clients and guides, clients uh, expect accurate and honest information from guides, especially in regard to regulations. Um, their personal beliefs and, and expertise will affect their receptivity to the guide influence, and ultimately uh, they can influence guide behavior through tipping. Guides, uh, in turn, provide and control the information they disseminate to clients. They really have an opportunity to educate clients. Um, uh, first and foremost, they construct and manage client expectation and, and experience. Um, and whether they realize it or not, they consider the client's openness to their messaging when providing conservation perspective. Fishing under your contract. I want to hit just a few details of the requirements under your contract. There's no guided freshwater fishing authorized under your contract, with the exception of a couple of historical operator, operators on the Dundas and Seclusion River. Why is this? Well, historically, um, guided fishing here in, in the park and in this area was marine-based. There was very limited freshwater demand, and uh, freshwater fishing, guided fishing, would occur in designated wilderness, and there are uh, requirements under the Wilderness Act and NEPA that would require us to first determine whether it's a necessary and appropriate activity, uh, especially in relation to things like unguided fishing and then you know how much level of use is, is realistic. We also have a few um, conservation concerns despite relatively conservative fish and game bag limits for these species uh, of steelhead and cutthroat trout whose populations can number you know, from 50 to low hundreds, um, particularly in, in uh, small systems and uh, newly emerged glacially influenced systems. We have a monthly sport fishing report requirement. Why is that? Because uh, management policy requires us to conduct harvest monitoring 
And even though you guys are required to um, report in charter logbooks, there's some issue with how well some of that information and the statewide harvest survey information agrees with the park information. So we still want to, we're still kind of testing that. It works really well in Glacier Bay proper and Outer Coast, but not so well in Cross Sound, Icy Strait area. So I just want to focus on the survey reports. They're due the fifth of each month for the previous month. They're vessel trip and location based. Uh, use one or more lines for each location that you stopped and fished at. Um, record the boat effort, not the individual angler effort, but the boat effort for all of the anglers at each fishing location by either salmon or bottom fish. And then um, report the species captain released at each location. And, and most importantly, um, or equally as importantly, I should say, report fishing effort even if there were no fish caught. Sharks exhibit relatively low uh, reprodu reproductive capability with you know, only uh, up to maybe half a dozen pups per year. And one added benefit of, of not harvesting rockfish is that they tend, tend to bioaccumulate relatively high mercury loads. We have an in-water halibut release requirement for those fish that you're planning to release. We urge you to follow best man management practices for all intentional releases of all species. Why? Because it reduces unnecessary stress and mortality. There is an NPS regulation that requires careful and immediate release. Ultimately, uh, a successful release and survival of that fish allows another uh, angler the potential opportunity to catch that fish. Well, there's quite a bit of uh, best management practices guidance online. Basically, uh, they all boil down to the type of gear you use. There are uh, certain gear types that are better than others. Hooking location, where the fish is hooked, uh, determines its survival capability as, as well as playing time and release methods. Um, there's a couple of NPS links that you can look at here. There's other information online. Ultimately, if, if it just takes too long to, to release that fish, you know, one of the best things you can do is just cut the line above the hook. Eventually that hook will work its way out. There's a fish consumption advisory and, and we would really appreciate if you would uh, create client awareness for this. This is something that was produced by the State of Alaska Department of Public Health and it's a guideline available online uh, for Alaska women and children and, and it uh, relates to eating fish safely, mercury harms developing nervous systems in unborn babies and in young children. Um, this particular approach is a bioaccumulation based point system. Uh, eating fish is good, but uh, not particularly old, long lived fish because they tend to really load up on that mercury. So we ask you to post this on board your vessel. Awareness enables individual action um, and here's a link where you can download that. Finally, there's a couple of other non-contract items that I just want to touch on briefly. Uh, firearms, firearm discharge and use of other explosives like seal bombs and fireworks, as well as like bang sticks are prohibited. Guys and, vi visitors, are, guys and visitors are prohibited from using firearms, bang sticks or explosives for dispatching harvested fish and hazing or killing wildlife. Why? Because hunting is not allowed in Glacier Bay National Park. National Park Service nationwide, National Park Service nationwide regulations prohibit discharge of firearms or other explosives. There are safety concerns with using these things. There are safety concerns with using these devices and um, there can be an impact on sound quality, especially in regard to underwater sound. The Marine Mammal Protection Act prohibits marine mammal take. Use of seal bombs may be considered a take. Finally, guided anglerfish. Uh, there is a use restriction in terms of guided anglerfish. There is no guided anglerfish uh, use in Glacier Bay proper. Why is this? Because we have a lifetime uh, access permit fishery, commercial fishery there uh, that authorizes only qualifying fishers to continue fishing there for halibut for the, re the remainder of their life. And um, non-LAP guided angler fish use in Glacier Bay is contrary to the regulatory intent. So even though GAF is not authorized in Glacier Bay, 
it is authorized for outer waters. Lastly, have a great summer, you guys. Fishing is a great way for you and your clients to experience the park. Please abide by all rules and reg regulations. Consider the need to balance use and conservation. Be safe out there and have fun.